Welcome to Social Sessions. I'm joined today with one of the most hardworking and charismatic characters I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. From a traumatic background and conflicts with the law to becoming one of Scotland's leading warriors of prison reform and creating one of the most successful charities for helping people with lived experience in Cisco. I have had the pleasure of working closely with her and I'm proud and honoured to have her as a friend. Natalie Logan. Welcome to Social Settings, Natalie. How are you? I'm all right, Sean. Thanks. Thanks for having me. No, brilliant to see you. Um, so what a day can I just be every day it comes on, Natalie, right? I know you were kind of brought up in the kind of north end of Glasgow. Um, so can you just tell us a wee bit about how, how it was for you growing up? Um, oh, life was a bit mental, Sean, actually. So my childhood was... Probably a similar end that grew up with a man dad that was criminals. It was um it was not normal. Aye. It was no I don't know the definition of normal, but it was a bit bonkers growing up in Springburn, Evans Park Street, it's poverty, deprivation. Um mum was a criminal, dad was a criminal. Half of the family were trying to do good, half of them were just burling and making money and committing crime and Aye. um but I didn't know any difference, so it was okay for me at that time. You know, as a child, you don't know any difference, so you just grow up with what you've got. Aye. Um, but moving into a different scheme, moving into Bishop Briggs is when I realised that <laughs> this is a completely different world. One is, like, fucking pink, and the other one is black. <laughs> um, but my childhood was tough. So. Aye. Did you find a... Like, obviously, because I know Bishop Briggs probably a wee bit more affluent, um... Did you fit in at Bishop Briggs or were you kind of the Lord one out or? I don't think I ever fitted in anywhere, to be honest with you. I don't think, and, I, and still I don't think I fit in anywhere. I think that I'm just a very individual person and I don't try to fit in. I don't try to conform. And I would say that. And I knew that as a kid. I think I instinctively knew as a kid that I didn't want to fit in with anybody. I didn't want to be part of a crew or a, I just floated about. I just absolutely floated about in a world of my own. Aye. So, obviously growing up, when was the first kind of signs that you, because we've obviously, we, we talk, we've, we've spoke to some people and it's obviously kind, kind of violence in the back, in the home and kind of maybe drinking, substance abuse in the home and stuff. Um, what kind of early ages was it when you kind of started kind of seeing stuff like that? Very, very young, very young. It, I can probably remember things to the age of three. You know, I'll say things and my mum will say, how do you remember that? Um, but very, very young. P probably my first traumatised, the, the first probably thing that really, really traumatised me as a kid, like really crippled me at the core was when the police came to my door to tell us that my dad had hung himself in jail. Like that for me, Sean, was I remember as a child known something really, really bad had happened. Cause my granddad was a businessman, he was a bookie, he was ne like never committed crime in Aye. his life. He was the one that tried to keep the family together. But he was a big man and I remember the post coming to the door and he just fell to his feet and I knew I was like something really bad's happened. And Aye. you know, when you're in about all that and we I was just the post coming to the door. That's Aye. the thing. You know, post coming through the door or your dad had a warrant or my dad was doing seizures on the roof and you had police helicopters and this is in Bishop Briggs, you know, where everybody's apples Aye. and pears and everybody looks down on you. But that, for me, really, really crippled me as a kid because watching my granda fought his feet, you're like, right, okay, something really, really bad has happened. But then 
hearing this, uh, to this day, I remember the screams. That's right. what traumatised me is the that memory of my mum uh, and my nana screaming, like just screaming throughout the house. And my dad was very, very well known, Sean, right. like all throughout the UK, very well liked. So there was people pulling up in my street and cars that I had never seen before and clays that I had never seen before. It was like a real mafia movie, you know. Right. And people still to this day say, your dad's funeral was like something out of a movie. Right. Because he was just so well liked that that was the first memory that something bad's happened here. Like, this is crazy. Why are all these people in and out and people are screaming and inconsolable? What age you at this time, Natalie? So I'm five and that's probably my, my, my first layer of despising the justice system. And obviously that probably that something dies in you there. Like there's probably something that as a kid, that whole thing of like as you say, is you're used to police coming but blah blah blah. That's but the whole fact that your dad's actually took his own life, um, and not knowing why and, and the reasons and stuff like that, there is only the justice system you can blame. So how do you how do you go over that, Nally? How do you kind of, do you ever, could you ever forgive them? Or are you just like, no, like that's. No, no, I'll never forgive the justice system actually because he was in a place of care. Aye. Right? They were responsible for him, Sean. That's the bottom line. And they knew that he was going to, he was on suicide watch. Aye. So the bottom line is they knew that he was going to do it. My family knew he was going to do it. You know, my dad was saying like, he was, going to get a big sentence on and he was saying the system's not going to beat me so right away my family knew he's going to do something he's, aye, aye. we need to be careful he's going to do something so they knew that he was not in a good place Sean so I can't forgive them because they took their eye off the ball no I understand that it's totally understandable Natalie and it's just um, we, I mean obviously me and you have spoken millions of times about trauma and how it kind of affects people and as a five year old um, building up that hatred for a, just a system that you actually knew champion for just kind of shows how um, the character he just um, and shows how good a person you actually are that you can actually go in and take that and turn that and I know you've had obviously a big long history up, up to that um, so I'll just kind of touch on, obviously we can come back to talk about the justice system, but just kind of take you back to your teens and that. How did that, obviously, trauma, do you think that kind of followed you into that, into that kind of life then, like into your teens and stuff, Natalie? It embedded the decisions that I made throughout my life. Because, so as a real assay with a dad, you've, you've got somebody with abandonment issues, you've got somebody with rejection, so... I had daddy issues, so I would always seek out like relationships with the wrong type of people. And I wouldn't sit in your company, actually, unless you were a somebody. Aye. Um, because of who my family were and just, I didn't sit about with afties. Aye. Right, and I don't say that because I think that I'm somebody, because I'm not, I'm not no, on no, anybody. But no. when I was younger, I, wouldn't, I didn't want to sit about with afties. I wanted to sit about with gangsters and somebody that had a name and a label and somebody that were, people were scared there. So that shaped all the decisions, you know, like I hated the police. Aye. I hated the social work. I hated the prison environment. And I grew up in an environment where it was, you don't talk to them. Aye. They're scumbags. Aye. And still to this day, my mum will still say that, like, don't speak to the filth. And I'm like, that's my job, mum. I'm Aye. doing. <laughs> I need to do it. <laughs> no, but I think it's pro it's very, very uh, prevalent in the, the schemes in the North End. Um, no to trust the police. Um, no to trust the, th the authorities. Um, there is a massive problem with trust and authority. And there is a good reason for it. There's mm -hmm. been a lot of letdowns. Um, and we can say it work is because we work we see different sides yet and you see good people in authority but there, there are still a lot of massive gaps um and obviously we'll try and fill them a wee bit today but where did that so to obviously kind of hanging about with the rank people blah 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 do you start taking substances this do you start getting into drugs and stuff like natalie and drinking and stuff and so i think if you if you've never been comforted or served, then you, your system will navigate towards something that will serve the system. Of course. 
so for me that was drugs and alcohol and I, and I learned very very early it was like a comfort blanket because <clears throat> I didn't have to think Aye. so lots of things happened in my childhood Sean lots and lots I won't go into it because my kids are still young Aye. and and I won't there's things that I won't talk about until they, they're old mm -hmm. enough to know but hundreds and hundreds of stuff went on in me and my sister's childhood like we went through the wars 10 aces by the time we were what 11 12 years of age Aye. Like really, really hard challenging. So the minute I found drugs and alcohol, I was like, oh, yes, this is like a fuzzy warm blanket. And it's brilliant because I don't have to deal with it. My head is like a circus on a good day. Aye. Like even today, Aye. like I wake up in the morning and it's like, boom, 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 boom. You're worthless, you're useless. You're... So see, as a kid waking up with all that, like as an adult, I struggle with it, but... When I try and think back to being like an 11, 12 year old child, Aye. waking up with hundreds and hundreds of trauma, abandonment issues, like rejection, like it's no wonder that I chase something for ease and comfort. No, definitely. Like alcohol just absolutely numbed everything. Aye. And then you throw powders and pills into the mix and it's like taking out the door for three and four days because you're bendered up so you're not thinking about Aye. your ma being in jail and your dad hanging himself and your grandparents bringing you up and no seeing your sister for four and five days do you know what I mean you're just Aye. you're with your pals having the jollies Aye I think that's obviously where we're going to go into we're going to go into how um, how much that is actually a problem how many people are actually affected by this and no everybody pulls through you Natalie um, a lot get kind of left in um, traumatising environments. A lot get left um, and don't have the strength that you found. Um, so if we can go back to like, how how does it change? How how does it how do you go for going? Do you know what? Fuck this! Like I need to really change. I need to get. I need to start kind of going down a better path. Where does that? When when did that change, Natalie? Um, so I started using drugs and drinking when I was 11. Uh, and and by the way, I've went to every single country to try and escape the the problem that I thought was drugs and alcohol. And it wasn't the problem, it was me. Aye. Um, You'll find drugs anywhere, wouldn't you? Anywhere, you Sean. Aye. I went to Manchester, I found crack cocaine. Um, I went to California to stay and, and I ended up full of crystal meth and caught up in a relationship with somebody that was in the Mexican mafia and fell pregnant to that man and had to escape that country. And that right. still wasn't enough. That still wasn't enough for me to be like, get a grip, you're pregnant, you're going to have a kid. Like this kid can't right. go through what you went through. I still had like hundreds of scars, Sean. And, that, and that's the thing with traumas, really, really deep rooted. And you've got two beautiful children and all like- um, Amazing boys. That are- I would, I would say just looking at her, I'm definitely not traumatised in any way. They're so happy. And so I think that's, again, shows your character that you're actually able to do that. But do you think that was a kind of change then, Natalie, when you were pregnant, you went Annie A? Not even, no. So but Braden was born, I came home from America when he was, when I was seven months pregnant. So he was probably born semi-addicted to substances. Aye. Um, and, and I kind of got my shit together for, for a while. I really tried, you know, I tried my hardest, but it's hard to do things when you don't have the tools. Definitely. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know how to be a mum because nobody showed me how to be a good mum and how to... Nobody showed me how to be a good ma. Do you Aye. know what I mean? Like, I never seen it as a child, and I'm not saying my mum didn't love me because my mum loves me more than anything in this I world. I love her, ma, she's lovely. She gave me the tools which she had as ah, a kid. of course, You know, know. And, and she's a great grandmother and she, she she's absolutely made up for, for things in her childhood, but I couldn't give Braden what I didn't have when he was born. Aye. So I got into another toxic relationship with somebody that sold drugs, fell pregnant again, and it wasn't until Kobe was 18 months old the, the Waynes get took off, maybe social work posts were involved. Aye. Um, I was in a drug psychosis, running up and down my street with a knife. My my neighbour had to contain me. I get section three times. Um, and it was at it's that hard point. to believe in on no seeing you, Natalie, and just seeing the the strength that you give people in prison and stuff like that, and the strength that you get, they give people in Cisco. Um, 
And hopefully we can uh, maybe even we'll try and get a wee bit of footage or something for Cisco that can just show the actual good work that, that, that you're doing. And hopefully maybe get a wee, we can play a wee video then. But the the atmosphere in that place is amazing. Um, and I first obviously met you, Natalie, when we came a, when you came to Berlin and we were the first people to open up the recovery cafe, which to me was my biggest achievement. I got my degree and stuff in jail, but it was my biggest achievement and prison was building that with you. Um, so how did you come up with that idea? How, would, how, how Was that your idea or was that Phoenix's idea? Or was that... <clears throat> Do you know what? I have to be honest with you and I've looked at this. I think that was God's idea. So you have someone that has so much pent up resentment against the system, like a, a real despise. And then... I know, because it's amazing you've come in with that. And or 360, place, aye, 360 aye. Sean, like, you know, I still have issues with authority, no, but, I, I, um, and I don't condone what they do, actually, I, quite the opposite, but an officer approached me, Julie Cree, and um, fantastic officer, actually, she's on my board, like she's on uh, the board of Cisco, she's brilliant, and I had set up something in White Inch, and she had just says, look, can you come into the jail, and can you do something, and when I come into the jail, and I had a conversation with her, and um, a guy, Neil Fraser, who again, brilliant senior officer, really, really got it. And, and when, when I listened to them, I thought, aye, aye, I can do it. And when, when I went away and thought about it, and I thought, the only way I can do this is I need to speak to the problem. Aye. And the problem are where you guys at that time, aye. they were the prisoners, because you have the questions about what's right in the justice system, what's wrong in the justice system, what's broken in the prison, aye. what can be fixed. Like, I don't fucking know. I'm not in Berlin doing a life for an LTP or a short-term sentence, you know what I mean? So it would have been patronising for me to come in and go, right, Sean Chief, this is what we're going to do, and I'm going to tell you. So I had to come in and say to you, was like, Sean, how can I make something work in this jail? <clears throat> so you set it up, you guys done that, you created the model. I think... Um... The way you approached it is the key, I think. Um, and I've tried to explain this to people. Prison's a different beast for anything that you can't, you can't go into prison. There's so much politics involved. You can't explain it to people it, like on a, on a level that if you've never experienced it, if that makes sense, Natalie. Mm -hmm. um, but the way you come in, it was like um, a breath of fresh air. It was somebody that go is, somebody that was listening to us, somebody that was ready to kind of sit down. And it was in Berlin, which was a shock to me because I kind of thought, Berlin is an officer's jail, it's crew's jail, what people call it, they let you know it's, it's that. Um, but they had a good governor, didn't they? I mean, we we done the presentation in front of the governor and he was really open to the, the, the because there was a lot of security issues. Um, that they have to, and you've got to see for their point, they're going, we can't, we, we've never in the history of the SPS gave them a room to go and just sit with no prison officer in it, nobody watching it. It was like a big risk they took. And I would like to thank them for that. That was, it was, it was, it was a good, but that model's been now put out, I think Natalie, is that right? It's been kind of put out, that kind of recovery cafe models in all the jails now, is that right? I think they'll try and create something to what we've done, Sean, but they'll never... I think what happens is one jail will do something really, really good Aye. and then all the other jails jump on the top of it, but they don't... How does that happen? But now, how do? Because the thing we created was amazing. So how does that... How does it get... How does it get distorted through the way? Because nobody actually comes to me and says, how do you create this? Can I look at your model and can we replicate it throughout the prison? They just try and copy it and they don't realise that it doesn't belong to me. Aye. It's not my model. I didn't create it. Aye. Do you know I would be a liar if I sat here and says, aye, Sean, I absolutely knew what I was doing when I came in there. I had no idea. I had to sit with you and go, what do we do? Aye. Like, how do we make this righteous for the boys in this jail? Like, how can I come in here and spend my time and do something meaningful. And and for me as well, it was about making an amendment Aye. back to a system that I absolutely hated. Like, so I have to go in there with a viewer. I want to go in there and help every man in that room so that no wee lassie does not see their dad. Aye. Like no child should not have their parent return after prison. Not only that, Sean, if we're saying that you're going to prison 
and we're going to give you a lifetime sentence and and during that time, like we need to restore you as a prisoner, right? So it's about giving you education, giving you life skills. If you're a parent, giving you parenting tips. Did you get that in prison? No, I got I got more out of the recovery cafe um, than I did the full probably thirteen year prior to that. Um, And that's no, I I try I try hard not to disagree the prison system because it's a hard job and understand, but. I was I, the the way I was the way I I grew up in prison. Um, I learned a lot of bad behaviours. Um, I learned a lot of kind of manipulative behaviours. I learned how to. I never get through the system because I'm a hard man or anything. Like, that's like that wasn't me. I got through because I had a good personality and because I was kind of liked everybody and I got on with everybody. I didn't get involved in people's stuff, um, and I just kind of but. I also know that I'm quite a good speaker and I can kind of hold hold a conversation. Um, and I think when you're going into places, me and you, obviously, you, it was you, obviously it was your, your cafe, Natalie, but we worked together quite closely. And I think what they're missing is they're missing, you need to pick the right people to create it at the start. And it's only the prison that knows that, that they know the people that will help create a good cafe. You know yourself, you can bring one person in a fair prison. I've always tried to explain this. One person you could bring in, it changes the dynamics of the whole hall. Never mind a recovery cafe. So how do you do that, Natalie? How do you kind of navigate your way around about making sure that you you get the right people into the cafe? Because that was what happened when I was there. It was like, it was always the right people. It was always the right content we were getting told. How did you manage to do that? I just listen, Sean, I just listen. I think the thing with me is, because I am a wee bit of a widow, Aye. do you know what I mean? I, the reality is I've seen, heard, been involved, done things that, just the same as you, like I'm, I'm no a dafty, so, Aye. and I go in there and I don't act like a dafty, I act like myself, I don't put on a shirt and tie, I don't act superior, I don't, I meet everybody at face value, it doesn't matter if you're sitting at the corner of Queen Street or you're mixed only the governor of Berlin, you're getting treated the same way. Aye. And I think I just go in there and I just act like myself and I tell the boys, I'm just here to provide you with a wee bit of something that you didn't have before. Aye. And it intrigues them, do you know what I mean? It intrigues them because they want, nobody wants to leave the jail an addict, Sean. Nobody. No. And I've said it before and I, I, won't, I won't go back on it. The statistics that they put out are not true. Hmm. Um, when they say like 60% of people are taking drugs and that, I would say it's high 90s. I would say it's high 90s and I think it's even worse now. I've not been in the prison system for a long time, but I've still like got a friend that I kind of keep in touch with and he says it's the worst it's ever been. And I know that's no down to the prison, that's down to different drugs and different kind of different types of drugs like spice and we'll go into that later, spice and benazolam and whatever you want to call it, atizolam and all the different kind of designer drugs that you're getting. But the last time I was in Adiwell, I could see people and it was like lost souls and there was nothing there for them. And I remember my partner saying to me, I'm going to lose you here. Like this is cutting, like this is, there's a wee chat. And there was nothing in Adiwell, nothing. And I'd came through Berlin where there was the, the big recovery cafe. You had something, you had places, you had somewhere to go, somewhere to talk um, confidentially mm-hmm. with support for your peers. No judgment. Um, you just didn't have it, Nadia. Well, and I was starting to see, and I think they're getting better. I think they're trying, and I think people. But I just don't understand how they can adopt that same system we had in Berlin, and can I put that through the system because it worked so well. I mean, how many success? Truthfully, the the the, the success rate and top end is terrible. How many of you actually got out now? I know you've got. I know you personally have got a good few people out the door. On the basis of the recovery cafe? So 11 lifers, Sean. 11 lifers today and not one's been recalled. Which is, that, so that's 11 out of 11. And I don't think, I would say the success rate of getting through the top end, I'm being generous in 30%. I think most people get downgraded at least once or twice before they get through. Mm. So you've succeeded with 11 lifers. And I know some of them are the, most, some of the most damaged and chaotic lifers I know some of them so lifers that you would go he's never making it he's never he's going to get recalled you've 
you've managed to keep out of prison for years now, Natalie. So does it not annoy you a wee bit that you your system works like that and it doesn't get put across nationally? I don't it does I don't I don't understand it. Yeah, it's very, very frustrating. But it's like um jobs for the boys, isn't it? Aye. It's, you go to go up to the Scottish government and rub balls to to be in there. I don't want to play games, Sean. I don't want to play games for this. This is people's lives. It's a, like, I'll do this for the rest of my life for nothing. Do you know what I mean? Because it's about helping the guy next Aye. door. It's very, very important to me. And it's, I do this in honour of my dad. I don't do it for money or ego or, but it's very, very frustrating when I'm like, we've done something that works incredibly well. Like, just for a report there, I had today, like, a report for the Scottish Government, like, right. how many people did you see and how many people disengaged. So, Berlin alone in one year, we've seen 2,000 cons. That's pretty much... No, that's insanity, do you know what I mean? Like, I can't dilute or I can't change the numbers. They're prison numbers. They came to our prison system. So in one year, we've seen 2,000 cons, some type of intervention, whether it be come to the recovery cafe. So we're in there five days a week now. We've got Aye. a counsellor in there two days a week. We've got a school of recovery. We're doing trauma survivor stories. We're, like, we do so much, do you know what I mean? But 2,000 cons in one year. So we've had an impact on all the wee guys in Aye. one year. That's incredible. That's planting the seed. It's actually, like, for, 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 for what I'm hearing, and obviously you just hear bits and bobs, but it actually sounds as if Berlini, which was definitely the worst prison in, in Scotland when I was kind of in there, like for 2005 all the way up, seems to probably be the most kind of progressive now. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be, it seems to have been com coming for the recovery cafe. And I, I think the staff in that are starting to see as well now that it's, it's kind of working into it. I think they're sending people and seeing, they're taking a bit more pride in their work mm -hmm. um, in the halls and actually looking for people that they can send to these places now. Um, and obviously you're never going to get, there's always, you're, it's a prison we're talking about, it's an environment that's toxic, you're never going to fix fix it completely, but the stuff that, that you're doing, Natalie, is like so progressive, but where is it stopping? Is it stopping? Like, say I'm, say I'm Adiwell and you just, how does it, how do you, how do you know get in there? If you just go like that, I've got this system here, can I come in? How, how does it go about, how do they say no? So they would all say, yeah, that's the thing. So all the jails would say, oh, I, I will let you in, we'll let you in five days a week, but the Scottish Prison Service don't want to pay for it. Or So what happens is the Scottish Prison Service will get a set amount of funding for the Scottish Government, and that's they're budgeted that out. So they've not put in a budget for a recovery cafe, so therefore they can't pay for it. So they all want it, but they don't want to pay the money for it. Do you know right. what I mean? I guess obviously you've got to make a living, Natalie. It's not like you're, and you're not, it's not as if you're making millions off it. Do you know what I mean? You're not, you're making a living, like a, an honest living that's helping a lot of people. And looking on the back of it, if you want to take in numbers and statistics, the numbers that you're talking, if you have saved 11 lifers, they 11 lifers are probably costing into the millions of pounds. If you take it per year, they're probably you know, half a million then. Like so, you're talking. Ah, you're talk, So you're, if you've had them out for three years, you're then saving an awful lot of money, Natalie. So why can they not find this money? This is where this is where I get frustrated because I start going, you know, it's working. So what what is the problem? Like where you can find the money for crazy, stupid things, English classes that nobody goes to, and there's like mm. attendance of two people and. I don't know, just stupid classes, do you know what I mean? But they can't find something that's kind of proven and it's working. I don't, it's, it's kind of beyond me. The system's broken, Sean. The system's broken, but we need to restore the whole system. Aye. The system is completely faulty. Like, for me, I think that all Scottish prison services should be the same. So, like, we're rolling out the match standards, which means that people get access to medical treatment on the same day. Like, we're doing trauma-informed is the new buzzword, right? But everybody says trauma-informed. Trauma-informed is an action. It's not just a word, right? We need to be responsive to trauma-informed. They need to completely break the house right down and rebuild it for the foundations. And they need to do it in every single jail, Sean. Aye. 
and there there will be these wee warriors or officers that are outstanding and it's down to the governors just to try and find these officers that are outstanding, that are empathic and caring and that actually give a shit for the cons and put them forward to create recovery spaces and safe environments and, and wellbeing hubs like during lockdown, Mick Stoney, who I have mad respect for as a governor, Hands like make, really, really respect him. He's a fantastic governor, really fair actually no, as a governor. Definitely had asked us to go in and just kind of support the jail during lockdown, loads of people using drugs on uh, moors, suicide watch. And I remember going in and a wee guy, like, is absolutely fucked on drugs, had been used in spice, just not in a good place. This wee guy, horrendous childhood, the wee boy. But as I went to leave, I remember he was hanging on to my legs and begging me. Going in, oh, leave me, going in, oh, leave me. I don't think I'm going to get, I feel emotional actually because I can just, uh, I'm in that space. And I remember leaving that day and in the car I was crying inconsolably thinking, that must have been my dad, you know, that desperately Aye. searching for something better than what he had. And in the car I, I made a, a pact to myself that even if I never get paid, even if I didn't get a penny, even if I had to beg, uh, that I would never stop doing what I was doing because the benefit was I got to go home that night, send that wee guy an email, and in two days he responded to me saying, thanks for your email, I've worked through some of the tools that you gave me, and I'm feeling a wee bit better. Amazing. And it's just, it's... um. And I know for obviously firsthand how hard prison is and I hate when you hear people saying it's like a it's a holiday camp and all this stuff. It's, it really gets to me because um in the Matt Standards thing, right, this is where you'll know better than me, Natalie. I've seen this stuff and I've heard about it getting rolled out in prison. I don't I can't see it working right. It's not happening. I don't believe it. I, there's no way you're gonna sit down with a doctor and go, Listen, I've got this problem, I've got an opiate problem what are my options? And he's going to roll out five or six different options. Not happening. When I went to Berlin, um, they basically told me I was on sleeping tablets, Zopiclon, which I know are kind of, they can be used as currency in prison. But when I went to Adiwell, to Berlin, they went, we don't give that drug out. I says, um, you're not allowed to do that. I went, that's like, you kind of just put a generic ban on a sleeping tablet. I went, no, no we don't get it out here. So I actually had to go and get my MP to write a letter and my partner wrote a letter saying, look, he's been on these things, like they've gotten through a sentence and you're just taking them off. And I was going like cold turkey, obviously, you know, you're saying that, like coming off sleeping tablet, you can't sleep. So it was like two or three nights. And then they came to me and they went, look, we'll gear him, but like don't say it to anybody. So that's the kind of medical treatment that we were getting when I was there. And I was you're only talking four or five years ago. So the things I've been watching and the people I've been hearing uh, talking about, uh, like, I'm not going to say names, right, but, people, oh, no, Matt Standards will get rolled out, this, that. Can I see it? How's that? How you seen it in prisons? you seen it working? So the Matt Standards were meant to be rolled out years ago. that right? But we're only starting to talk about it now. Right, I never knew that, Natalie. So the Matt standards have been out for a couple of years now, Sean, but we're only starting to talk about it. And I've been in a number of meetings um, in the prison where even the governor's saying, how's how's this possible? How's this going to work? Do you know what I mean? How are we going to fit it into a prison system? Aye. Sean, you know yourself, you can put in a CP to go and see a doctor and not see a doctor for two weeks in Berlin. You know, there's one Easily. doctor for about four... 1,400 cons. And they, they, you're actually limited to like a couple of minutes. Well, it was like that when I was there. It was like a couple of minutes and you were limited to... So you weren't actually getting to see... And then trying to see mental health, was that was that was months. I don't know if that's the same, but um, trying to see a psychiatrist or something like that was... I don't know, I remember waiting 12 weeks or something. Do you know what I mean? The, the first guy, there was a guy came into Adiwell my head was all over the place. My pill was on at the time. I was like really, really, um, and I was starting to kind of take, um, I was on medication, but I was on like amitriptyline and Seroquel and all these antipsychotic stuff and all that they were giving me, right? And I was like, just, I just needed a sleep and I needed my nerves to go. Like I, I was all over the place. I just couldn't, I just wasn't fitting in. It was just, it was a really bad time for me. Um, 
And I remember going up and I've tried my back. I've got two, my, my discs in my back are away, Natalie. So I went up and I tried to get um, uh, tram, my tramadol back. And I went in, the guy had a sign up saying no opiate-based painkillers will be given out and this thing. So I said, to him, you can't do that. And he was like, I can. I said, that's, if, 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 if the best case scenario, and I'm not saying opi opiates are a terrible drug, do you know what I mean? And I would advise it, nobody to start taking them. But... If that's the best case for your pain, that my standards have got to tell you that the doctor's got to give that, surely. You can't just generically ban a whole group of painkillers. Apparently they can do what they want. It's, um, it's a pure grey area, actually, Sean. One of the boys that I'm working with now, um, he's an older man, an older lifer. Stage three cancer, had half his lung removed. Now I go into jail and I watch that man and I say, because he's an older man, no family by the way, so Aye. while he's going through this cancer journey, he's coming down to us with holes in his cardigan and I was saying to the boys, like, is he not getting any clothes? Is he not getting any family? Like, so while he was going through it, I was like, I need to buy him jammies and slippers and like, that's horrendous, do you know what I mean? I but I would be going into the jail and watching him be escorted down to the doctors to get his meds because he was on opiate prescribed medication. Three times a day, Sean, he had to hobble down for Lefham Hall down to the doctor's surgery inside the jail. Which is a bit of a walk. That's a walk. So you've just had half of your lung removed, you've got cancer, and they're not trusting you to give you even a pack to take up to Lefham Hall to let the officers be in charge up there. Like, that's morally wrong. You can't say we're going to have my standards, right, and, and look at public health and then say to you, I'm not giving you an opiate. Do you think it's just to look good? Because this is, I hate to say it, right, but I've been, I was in prison for for a long time and these things come about all the time. You used to get people that would come in, we're going to change this, we've got nothing changed. And it was just getting what, and I swear the only thing that I seen what was the recovery cafe. I did see, because it was like a, I don't know for a better word, it was like a rehabilitate, a rehabilitation kind of um, environment. It was like a rehab environment that you were mm -hmm. going into. Um, you were learning about stuff, you were learning about drugs, what they'd done, why you were taking them. Like, you were learning what trauma was. You were it was stuff that you were getting informed about that you were going, right, that fucking makes sense, man. That makes sense. It was different speakers every week that were coming in. Um, I, I'd never seen that in prison, do you know what I mean? And obviously we worked hard on that, like, get it, and I know you went, went to town with the kind of hangy, but in, in, in the defence of the prison, the security are saying, no, they're doing this and they're doing... There's, there's, there's always going to... What, what annoys me is you go, they're going to pass drugs, and you're going to get past drugs anywhere, mm -hmm. anywhere in the prison. It doesn't matter where. This was always my thing. Like, as long as people weren't using it as a thing to get drugs passed and it was like a you're going to get drugs passed everywhere it's a prison like i don't get where the where that mind frame it's as if you're talking about a different place this is if you're going we're not in this environment so as if this i don't know security it's as if they've just got a totally different outlook for what's actually happening nobody wanted us in the jail sean we were lived experience, so that came with like massive, massive risks in itself. Because everybody that we, was going into the jail at the time was coming in with like pages of convictions. And I remember we Rab Care had said to me, Oh, you're Intel. And I'm like, My Intel? What are you talking about? My Intel? And he's like, We've got to have, we have to have Intel on in every one of you. We need to know. And I love Rab Care. Rab Rab's 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 brilliant Rab's brilliant again. He, he's, he's on my board. He's a good guy. Aye. He's um, one of the prison officers that just got it. Do you know? Aye, what I know mean? And he was a dog. Aye. And Rab will tell you that. Like, the beginning of his career, he was an absolute dog no, as a prison officer and he treated cons like animals. And it took for people like me to go in and, and give them an open mind and say, you can't speak to people like that. If you treat somebody like a dog, they're going to bark at you like an animal. Yeah. Treat them like a human being. And do you know what? You might just get something quite nice and kind back. And Rab totally changed his attitude. And with that, he got a, a bit of insight into, you know, if, if 
like I work with some of the most complex, chaotic Aye. guys. You've sat in the room with them, you know. Some yeah. of the young team are dead, dead difficult. Like we can't re retain the young team because they're not ready to go. Yeah. Right, okay, I'm, I'm putting my 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 boots up because I'm an addict or an Aye. alcoholic. Because they're bonkers, they're mental. They still no, want to no. be um, the reputation and all that kind of stuff. And they're loving the madness. That's it. But um, do you think like looking at? Looking at somebody just taking Rab for for an example, do you think that well, we've, I've I've spoken about this at length, kind of the way that p prison officers are conditioned, um, and then they become like a kind of gang, and they don't know it, they don't see because it, it, substance use is quite high in prison officers and stuff. They've got a lot of alcoholism, they've got a lot of kind of stuff going on because they're traumatized as well in my eyes mm -hmm. they see the exact same as what prisoners see mm -hmm. and they need to be a certain way because you, you can't go in as a prison officer and be soft because you'll be walked to the tappy so you do need to have a level of but it's about mutual respect if you've got that wee bit of respect which is hard today because as you say the young team will, are going to give you a hard time you're going to get this you're going to get that but as a staff member it's all about taking back you need to have that be by empathy compassion if you can bring that in it would be amazing like i've seen i've watched staff doing it people like rap care i've watched staff opening up their mind and going oh my like i've been i've been wrong for years man mm -hmm. and like my staff are wrong how do we how do we work on that natalie because that was something i tried to do in low moss I said, would it not be great to get a course where we could get staff and cons on it at the same time? I know it'd be very controversial. I said, but you could pick the right staff, the right cons, and we could get it. And they were like, oh, it's not going to work. They didn't even try it. But I think it would have shown that it's, we're all the same. We're all working class people that are conditioned in a certain way. That's why we wanted to bring Fritzy Horsman here, because the stuff that she does with the Compassion Prison Project is it's about bringing the the establishment together. Aye. Prisoners and prison officers. It's like, look at lockdowns, a perfect example of how everybody was affected by a trauma, because we were all isolated. It was horrendous, do you know what I mean? Aye. So, like, of course, everybody has traumas, but... Bringing Fritzy Hortzman over was an opportunity for us to really bring officers into that room and give them an understanding of here is what these boys are suffering for. Like, this is the conditions they've been through in their life. And we gave the prison officers an opportunity when Fritzy was going through the 10 ace questions. We gave them an opportunity to stand in the circle beside us and take part, which quite a lot of them did, which I took my hat off to them because to stand next to a con and say, I'm just as vulnerable as you, wee man. Like, that, that takes a lot of strength because they've also then got to put their um, officer hat back on I at know. the end of that day and look that boy back up. Do you know what I mean? So, but the reality is we all suffer from trauma. The whole of society is traumatised by something. And this is why I absolutely adore Mick Stoney as a governor because he grew up in an environment where he's seen it. So Aye. he had the parents that were, no, you're in at nine o'clock at night and you'll do your homework and blah, blah, blah. But the wee guys in the left and right next door and we're out to 11 at night and he resented them. So he'll tell me the story Aye. that I resented my neighbours for being out to 11 at 12 at night. I wanted to be out, but I didn't realise it's because their man and dad were addicts and alcoholics and they had no routine and no structure, do you know what I mean? And, and he'll say, no, I see the men in and out of the jail all the time. Do you know? So he, he grew up in that environment, but he had the parents that were able to say, no, this is what you do. Here's what's... It's about values in it. And that's what the young Aye. team... When I go into the jail and I look at the young team, and I could name a few of them now, I don't think I can, no, I don't think I would be able to, but like your, your wee mal, right? We'll Aye. see, because there could be a million wee mals, but, but your wee mal, like that wee kid just was never watered as a child. Aye. You know, he was that plant that was just left in the corner. No one spoke to watered and was expected to be a good person. I know. Do you know what I mean? Where he wasn't loved or given the, the proper values or integrity so we guys like that grew up with in the street with schemes with the wrong people looking up to the wrong people right. valuing the wrong people so they become a product to all that stuff that i've just said yeah and it's dead dead sad do you know what i mean because 
all that's missing in people like me and Mal and the, the many others was just that wee way in that was desperately needing somebody to just go, come and sit in my knee. I absolutely love you more than anything in this world. And you're going to be amazing when you grow up. You can be Neil Armstrong if you want. Nobody ever said that to me, Sean. And no. I guarantee you, like, half of the, the, the younger cons in there and even the older ones, nobody's actually ever said, here's what you're good at. No, I've said that before. I think the Scottish prison system is small enough where you could have different prisons doing different things. Like you could go, you could have it um, if like you were just good at mechanics or whatever. Like you could have different, if you were wanted to go and do like a degree, you could go to this prison, you could go to sm small enough Scotland. I mean, it's not a huge place, do you know what I mean? Look at America. America's massive. Um, even England, do you know what I mean? It's huge yeah. compared to Scotland. Um but there's, you catch most governors, most officers on their own, they'll tell you the system's broke. Yep. They'll say, so, but they won't stick their neck out. And I get it, right? I get why they won't do it because they'll, you can't, I mean, you can't go up against the system itself. But I was talking to James Docker about it and we were talking about the Scandinavian model and stuff like that. And it's frustrating to hear that the model of the recovery cafe, I mean, you're in there five days a week now, Natalie. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, like, um, Adiwell, we've got, like, tours. And I don't know, what, what are you supposed to do in tours? Like, at the Recovery Cafe, you come and it was, like, probably, like, half an hour, you would be saying all right to everybody and all that. Then half an hour at the end, you would be, like, everybody, right, we'll see you later, blah, blah, we'll see you next week. So you're, t what can you do within that? You need, you need time. Mm-hmm. And that's what you've managed today, Natalie, is break down a prison. No break it down, like that's maybe the wrong word, but you've managed to show a different side that what can work, what can look, what we can do with some people. I mean, a loving life, is, that's phenomenal. A lot of people won't, a lot of people are living life, like a loving, that's huge. Mm -hmm. It's a massive number that you've saved. So many lifers are lost in there, Natalie. I oh, know. Like, totally lost and won't get out. I mean, my pal, um, like my wee pal Dumps, he's up in Stockton. 15 years he's done out a two wreck. And it makes me, I actually get upset thinking about him because he's such a good boy and he doesn't. But again, you're like, where do you get the, how do you get, how do you, how do you even start to, because how many meetings have you been to Natalie when they're all agreeing with you and you think you're getting somewhere and then it just dwindles, man? And I'm no, it's no the prison's fault, it's nobody's fault, but is it, where is it a society? Do you think, do you think as a society we're not ready to help prisoners? Is that what it is? Do you, I don't know. It's like cowboys and the Indians, isn't it? There's got to be good guys and bad guys, Sean. I think that society feels comfortable with knowing there's good guys and bad guys and society for the close-minded will think that we put the guy, bad guys in prison where when you strip it back, the bad guys are mostly all victims. Like, don't get me wrong, I, there, there needs to be... We need to have prison, Sean. No, of course. Because right? there's I, a no, percentage no, of the that. population that's in them that absolutely needs to be in no, them, but... I can honestly say, I mean, I've sat in the room now with thousands and thousands of cons throughout the years now, Sean, like between the work in Sockton, Adiwell, Shots, and Berlin. And out of all the times that I've been in and out of the jails, I've probably only ever sat with one, one guy that I could probably genuinely say he should never go out. Aye. He's a proper evil. wrongian, evil to the core, nasty and... I wouldn't want to meet him Aye. in an alley, but and and that's me. And you know yourself, Sean. I, I was going into a room myself with all you guys, Aye. and um, if I was to have read on paper what was wrote about you, do you know what I mean? Like nobody would have wanted to sit with you because no. the the pieces of paper would make you out as like the worst kind of people in society. When I met you, so I was just like. There's nothing bad about you. The Aye. the reality is most people in prison are there because they, one, either made a really bad choice, Aye. two, messed up because they needed money for substance misuse or their, their alcoholism, or three, guys that have woke up the next day and went, why am I in a jail cell? Mm -hmm. What happened last night? 
Do you know what? I, I haven't sat in a room with people that went, here's how I... I here's how I committed my crime and it was all premeditated like society is so fucking delusional because they think that everybody in prison are all mastermind criminals and it's all premeditated crimes it's not prison is full of absolutely wounded wounded people that should probably when you look at it be in hospital they shouldn't be in a jail you know like when we look at trauma If I was to look at a wee boy and go, right, he was sexually abused for the age of three by every primary caregiver in his life. Then he was put in a care home. Then he went through 14 foster um, parents, was in the YOs. Like, what chance has that wee guy got? He's got absolutely no chance of surviving. And if us he's met with is officers that are, right, you wee arsehole, right, stupid. Like, if that's the way people speak to him throughout his life, he's never going to be a Neil Armstrong. No. And um, it's so the the officers. I think I hope like there's a wee change in there. But I mean, there's you, you still get uh, you get officers that still believe that you should be an SL with bread and water. Mm-hmm. Um, which listen, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I don't. Uh, it's not my opinion, but like everybody's entitled to their opinion. Um, I don't think that would work. Uh, what what I watched work was what we done at the cafe and informing people, uh, showing people where their wounds were, um, getting them, to, giving them the tools to maybe go and work. And listen, some of them might not do it, some of them might go back and go, choose the, the life of drugs because logistically and logically, it's escapism. You don't want to be in a prison, so why would you not take these drugs to escape? Mm-hmm. This is what we need to get right we need to get right that listen why are you why are you punishing somebody for doing something that their body's crying out for them today you're putting them in a cell and then you're punishing them for trying to get out of that cell and the only way getting out of that cell is taking drugs unless you're a mastermind zen that i've never met in prison once i've never met anybody that's that mastermind yoga that can control their own mind so you know you, the way it goes, and you're in a toxic environment, violence prevalent, there's drug dealing, there's there's just so much going on, and it's scary. Do you know what I mean? There are a lot of people, but a lot of prisoners don't like to admit that. It's, it's a scary place. Mm-hmm. So if you take drugs that masks that, it allows you to operate under a, a false illusion, but it allows you to do it, and it also covers up the wounds. Mm-hmm. So why, why do we know look at it and go, Right, we understand why you're doing it, but you, it's no, it's no, it's no the way forward. You're going to end up in a mess at the end of it. You're going to end up out, and you won't be able to control it. Why do we no look at that? I mean, I, you know, I mean, it's a massive question to ask you, but because we've not got the tools to sweep it up, that's the bottom line. Uh, that's when we were doing the stuff with Fritzy Hortzman. There was a big push for psychology to say like you're really going to open a can of worms by doing this stuff. And and it's like, stop. The can of worms is opened with these boys and lassies. Like, it's time we roll our sleeves up and get right in there to the nitty gritty. Like, when I was getting better, nobody, nobody ever in my, through all my years, and had said to me, like, why are you doing this to yourself, Natalie? Like, why are you absolutely ruining your life? Nobody. Sean, it was like, you better get a grip, you better stop it, you better. It was always the constant criticism, but nobody had actually right. sat down and went, what's going on with your kid? Like, what's happened in your life that you are want to smoke crack and take every drug you can to run for yourself? Nobody had asked me that. We need to get better at asking why. Why you're running away and, and like, we shouldn't be building more jails. That's the bottom line, Sean. No. We shouldn't, what we should be doing is getting armies to go into schools, like, my my oldest son, who's in six years, study wants to study psychology. Dead, dead clever wee boy, but he got better with me. Aye. So he went through recovery with me because I was I was in caught up in addiction when Braden Aye. was a wee boy and Colby. So they two have went through the whole repair process with me, and they've watched me grow and blossom as a person. But um, they had the races too. Aye. So through my process of repairing and getting better I've been able to help them heal and get better too and 
and being able to do that, I've got two healthy kids. Aye, right, beautiful. I'm not saying that they're, they're unscarred because no, they're kids, there'll be scars but, there, aye. but I look at my my son who's going to be 17 tomorrow, and he's got a better understanding, a adverse childhood experiences, and you know he's going into school today. He actually challenged the anti bully policy because there's so much bullying happening in school, and he's saying he's coming home from school and saying to me. I mean, they've got an anti-bully policy, but I mean, there's there's kids self-harming, mum. And I says, well, maybe you need to go in and champion that and, and speak about it and be that pupil that's really challenging that. You know, there's a thing in schools and all the ways will say, go kill yourself. Aye. Right, and it's used dead, dead freely. And my kids have been saying it for years, Sean, and I hate it. Because I'll say, your granddad killed himself. And they'll go, Aye. oh, come on, everybody says it's just something you say. But imagine, like being a wee kid that's got no pals and you're self-harming and you come from poverty and disadvantage and every second kid's saying to you, go kill yourself. Eventually you're going to go kill yourself. Do you know what I mean? It's so ha happening until you get I mean, it's like a lot of these young ones, you know, there's a lot of kind of young people killing themselves. Self-harming um, is very, very, very rife in the schools now. So what we need is Sean Tolls, Natalie Logans, James Dockeries that can write into these schools to say, you want a life of crime? Do you want to go to jail? Because here's what's going to happen. Aye. Like, you want to run a bit with all the dafties? Aye. You want to punt a wee bit of green for 30, 40 pound or enough for your joints at the weekend? Like, is this what you really want to do? Because this is what the consequence is Aye. going to be. And if you don't want to do it, here's an alternative. Because we can't offer alternatives in Scotland, Sean. I know. We can't say... It's like, a punitive system. It's a it? punitive so it's, system. So there's no justice in the justice system. We need to take the, the justice out of it. restorative... Um, justice where we can even look at um, look at, I mean looking at the victim side you've got to see their point do you know what I mean they they, they want uh, justice and this and that but I've said before um, like house see like house breakings and stuff like that right see if that's scary for some people right and I get it if you've never been involved in it you'd be like oh my god there was a guy in my house mm -hmm. see if you were to sat across for that guy and you've seen him at his weakest point when he's rattling and he's the, he's just come at the police station and he's you would be like oh my god like you would see the person for what he is and you would go he didn't mean to do that he didn't mean to break into my house do you know what I mean he's only breaking into my house I was unlucky he didn't choose me he didn't go I'm going to break in and this is where you've got to differentiate crime where people you do get monsters and you get mm -hmm. horrible people that are but as you say, it's a very, very much a minority. But I just think that I can sense a wee bit. I've been talking about this on the podcast quite a lot. That young team thing coming back in. I went away for a wee while back, starting to see the wee guys hanging about the streets again. And I can, I've can i heard, like, you just hearing things. And, I, and I'm like, oh, please don't go down this road again. Like, don't be honest, because it's just going to cause a lot of trouble again it's, but I, again I think that's poverty going up cost of living going up people start coming outside to play do you know what I mean and then it's the streets and where do the kids go we've got nowhere for the kids to go you you, you get four or five kids roaming about a street the police stop them and st stop them what he's doing but he's hanging about for us so it's all the like, same areas now it it? Is, so it's like where do we put the kids but we're not giving them environments to when we were in Ruck Hill, the, the police came to us and said, oh, there's a big problem with all the young team. They're going down to McDonald's in Mary Hill and they're giving the staff a really hard time and they're throwing bottles. And I'm like, well, what's their alternative? Well, you're, they're going to the park and you're chasing them at the park at night because you're telling them they shouldn't be there. So if you're chasing them at a park, they're going to go somewhere because they're trying to... They're kids, aren't they? Express ourselves and... And as a kid, we were the same. There was about 20 handy to us that would be Aye. down at Bishop Briggs Park or singing songs and the police would come and you would get a chaser. And that was your fun for a Friday and Saturday night was right. getting a chaser for the police. But we need to let kids be. We need to give them environments. We need to give them people that are going to nurture them. We can't just be like, they're bad kids because there's six of them stoning and they're getting all the guys in McDonald's with absolute pelters. It's a, it's a shame. See, when you look at this society, it's a shame for the kids, Sean. It's a real shame because there's no communities in communities anymore. There's no, no just in the justice system. We have such a punitive system. There's no Wayne's can't be Wayne's cause of social media anyway. And everybody has to try and be something or uh, I just think that society's just a wee bit mental now. And I just try and 
No, I agree. But you're scared to say stuff. You're scared to get too uh, political at times. You can't say your views. I mean, obviously, I know you're out. Well, I'm not. Man, I'm not. I, I, know, I, know, I, I say outspoken. it, but I end up getting pelters for it. That's the thing, because I am very vocal, and I think, well, why should I not say something? Why right. should I know? Because the bottom line is, if I'm somebody that was failed by a justice system and I'm trying to step in, this is their playground, Sean. It's not my playground right. and it's somewhere that I'm not going to pretend that I belong, but I'm going to step inside whether I'm an outsider or not and I'm going to try and help them build a better playground for guys like you because I want Scotland to be safer for my kids. Right. In fact, if I'm going in a night out, and I'm leaving the town on a Saturday night, I don't want to end up rolling about with somebody or, or my pals to be rolling about. Like, I want Scotland to be safer. And in order and do to think do that, that... Do you think that we're, we're, we're sorry to butt in there, Natalie, but I'm just thinking at this point, you know, it'd be good to kind of ask you, do you think the people we're sending out the new are rehabilitated? The vast majority... Like define take, rehabilitation. So tell me first. Let's define what we think rehabilitation means first. Right, this is what you. I was going. This is what I was going to try and do anyway with this, Natalie. Right? Because so what I've done here, right? I've done this. Um, so this is from the prison service, right? Okay. So this is who are we and what we do, right? So the Scottish Prison Service is an executive agency of the Scottish Government and was first established in April 1993. A framework document sets out the policy and resources framework that the Scottish Ministers within the SPS operates. As an executive agency, the SPS is funded by the Scottish Government, right? So we know all that. So if you look at their value system, which I was going, I'm going to try and get put up, um, we look at the values and it looks like they have professionalism. So they say the unlock potential, we will have the right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time. Their partnership, they say the unlock potential again, our collaboration with partners result in enhanced service provision and better personal outcomes for those citizens and leaving our care, transforming lives for purpose, our community Communities are safer because those citizens in our care are supported to build on their assets and return their communities as productive citizens. In governance, our services are very efficient and effective and provide value for money. Now, I know what I would say to that. I'll let you, you're in the prison system. Do you believe this model is what they're, they're working to? So take away the stuff that I've done to support some of the boys throughout the years. The good uh, stuff you take away the good stuff you take, take away, away all the good that, right? The, and the, and do I think that the Scottish prison service transforms lives for the better? A hundred and ten percent not. You when you wrote a letter for the Fritzy event and you wrote that bit at the back and it was about, you know, you, you put me into a prison and you teach me how to be a criminal. Uh, you tell me not to hang about with bad people, but you you mix me with bad people. There, there's that. There's no truer saying than that. There was last week. I'm in the jail sitting with a wee guy, and in twenty minutes told me how to rob a G4S van, how to get in the box, how to get the money out without getting the ink. Da, 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 da. No, that's twenty minutes of me as Aye. a professional going into the jail with these wee guys. Do you know what I mean? Like, does it transform lives for the better? Absolutely not. Not because. I agree. Any other other reason than the prison service is not set up to restore and repair. It's absolutely not. It's it's an unfair system. It's absolutely, it's unfair, Sean, and it's no fair that the Scottish prison service get to put up there that they're transforming lives. That's why, that, this is why I, I, chose, I chose you, Natalie, because I know you're in working with the, the prison system and I don't, I don't want to think in the get on the prison system's wrong side. I hope the prison system come on and speak and I would like to get their views on it, but I don't see any of that. I don't see, I see people getting transformed for the worst all the time. I see people either getting transformed into drug addicts or I see people getting transformed into better criminals. I'd see very little. I see, I maybe see somebody coming through your service or you'll maybe get somebody that turns to God. Mm -hmm. But in my whole time, that's maybe where you would get, or if you maybe met somebody that you were influenced by, that was a good influence, that 
that would be a reason the staff are not equipped to take, give their values it. And I'm not meaning that in a bad way, but they really aren't. And they're no interested in their values. They're interested in surviving their own day because they're traumatised, because they've got their own issues. Like if you're getting called a prick all day and you're getting and blah, 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 you're going to take it to heart. So I, don't, I get it for the prison officer's side. I'm not trying to be like hanging, but I hate that value system that the SPS put out because people reading that are getting a totally, totally distorted view of what's happening in the prison system. The, the prison system, it's dead dead. It's a pure complex area, Sean, because there's probably no much that I've no research when it comes to the, the prison system and prison systems around the world, actually, because I just try and look at what's good models and what can we implement at Cisco. But um, when I think about paying my taxes, right, as a taxpayer, I think about prisons is a big thing that you want to think about. And I think everybody in society should start thinking about this and having a wee look at it, right? Because if you're a taxpayer, I want to pay my taxes into something that works. So if, if we know that we can create a better justice system that offers a more restorative approach to getting better, a therapeutic element, psychosocial supports, like, we guys are going to get well, do you know what I mean? Like, you can't say you're transforming lives when, really, somebody's on remand for a year and only gets out of cell one hour a day. That How are you transforming somebody's life? If you're only getting out of cell one hour every single day for 365 days a year, what in that person's life are you transformed? You've isolated them, you've kept them away from their family, they don't have any tools, they maybe went six months waiting for a mental health assessment. Like, what have you transformed in their life? You've not, you've added on to their trauma. I think, uh, it's how, as you say, it's no fair to like totally, like, because they've got a hard job, they've got a limited budget, um, it's a horrible, toxic place. It's really, really hard to navigate. But be honest, man, wear it. Wear what you're doing. Mm. What you're doing is you're taking bodies off the street that have committed a crime, broke their, bro broke their social contract with society, you're putting them in a cell and you're, 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 you're maintaining them until their, their, their sentence is over and done with. There is there's very little transformation there unless that person goes looking for it. And to try and get somebody to go looking for it, as you say, as the wee guys, a young team, you might get lucky with one or two of them, but they're not interested in changing at that time. Lord Turnbull, who I, I, I don't really like, right, but I respect the man. He's very clever. He's good at what he does. He was a Lord Advocate. He's a judge, like... Very high, high up man. I, I, I take my hat after him. Wrote a paper saying, "Do not send people under twenty five to prison." And it was getting rolled out. I don't know where it's went wrong, but it's like as if they forgot the paper. The paper was it was starting to kind of. But now that it's again, they're just firing people into the jail again. And I think it's because they're building other ones. They need to fill them. I think it's society so risk averse. I know, Sean. Like I said, like we go back to the the cowboys and the Indians, and it's like society needs to have good and bad people. It Aye. makes it makes people feel better. It really does, do you know what I mean? It makes society feel better if they go, well, that wee guy's not engaging in school, he's smashing Wendy's, he's doing this and doing that, just put him in a care home. I know. Just put him in the jail, do you know what I mean? Just throw them away, throw the key, lock them up and throw the key away, and you know, I've still got family members that'll go, fucking prisoners in jail get more, better food than I do, and I'm like, really? Do you know that the fruit comes from the zoo sometimes and it says not for human consumption? Like, I know. are you that delusional that you think... So one of my volunteers, actually, um, we Brendan, he spent his time in Adewell, which is a more clinical environment Aye. for nobody that's been in prison. It's more like a probably a hospital, I would say. It's Aye. a very white wall environment. So he had never had an experience of being in Berlin. And you know yourself, Berlin is a Victorian jail, very old, old prison. Um, and it takes a lot actually to get through your time in bar. Like I've not done time in it, but everybody that I listen to, um, I listen to their stories. And, and Brendan last week got escorted into one of the halls to see the Aye. cell. And he phoned me when he left the jail and he went, oh my fucking God, Natalie, I swear to God, I feel like I was in jail in a hotel. Like I'll never complain about my jail time again. Aye. He was like, I can't believe the cells, like the conditions, the... 
you know, and Mick Stoney put his neck out in the line a couple of weeks ago by doing that article, by going in I the know. news and saying, you know, we've got massive problems here. We've got a Victorian jail, not fit for purpose. And the next day I had every reporter phoning me saying, is there going to be a riot in Berlin? He's dying to jump on a story. And I'm like, that's not what Mick Stoney's saying. He's saying there's going to be um, structural issues. He's going to, there's staff shortages. There's, the drug trends are changing. Like, <coughs> like you said, <coughs> Everybody that I see, almost everybody that I see, the noon jail shoes and something, Sean. This, I hate. I, I don't. I, I was in prison. Obviously, I, what what is the point of put the drug tests are still pretty. Um, like they, they don't. They're no fit for purpose in the way that they don't even. They don't even test the drugs that people are taking, right? Which. I'm, I don't want anyway. I don't. I don't want. It. I would. Don't, I don't think you should punish anybody for taking drugs, right? But. They're spending a wide load of money on drug tests that don't even pick up the drugs that people are taking, right? So the statistics are totally distorted in so many ways. Um, and these new drugs, I think that's getting the prison officers. I've spoken to a couple of prison officers and they're like, Sean, I would bring back heroin. That I've, I swear I've heard the governor, I've heard people saying that. Maybe Mick's no governors, said but it. the mix it. But Mick said that let's, I would rather flood the jail with heroin again. So see, this is where the, no, I've, I've uh, not, we won't say argued, I've disagreed with David Abernethy, the governor in Sockton. And I says, um, I challenged him and I says, the, the biggest thing that the Scottish Prison Service done was brought in the MDTs. Aye. No, it wasn't. And, you know, disagreed with me and I says, aye, it was, because what you had was, Men in national top end, lifers just getting through their Aye. sentence, smoking a bit of cannabis, Aye. not doing any harm, no risks, no riots, no problem, just putting their feet up and, and smoking cannabis. Now, I'm not saying that I condone any drug, no, but know. it's up to the individual how they get through Aye. their sentence. Now, there was no harm in that, Sean. Do you know what I mean? There was no harm in the prison system at that time. And then they brought in MDTs, so they brought in mandatory drug tests. So all the lifers that were just smoking cannabis realised I'm going to get a drug test and cannabis is going to be in my system for 28 days right. and I'm potentially not going to get out in pro if it right. shows up. So what they done was started using smack and drugs that they knew they could flush out their system in, what, 48 hours? So the prison service needs to take a wee bit of responsibility for the broken in people in Oshon. The whole thing's pointless. Then you'll catch somebody, one person from one poor guy off guard. I mean, I was in Tap End with a guy who lost his nephew. I don't know if you remember that, but he lost his nephew. And they drug tested him in the morning, knowing that that guy was probably going to go and take something. Yeah. And the guy just packed all his stuff, never took a drug test. Man, you can ram your drug test. And I'm like, right, okay, I get, I, I get that you just need to be on the ball and you just need to be, but you are basically going like, ah, he's lost his nephew. Let's get them, which is right. If you want to play detective, then it's you've, you've done your job well. But they're but, not detectives. I know. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and and the health services told us that addiction is a public health issue. So no officer should be allowed to punish somebody for a public health issue because then again you're saying right, okay, so where's the justice in that? If if I'm a diabetic and I need to have insulin twice a day to keep me alive and an officer saying to me, you can't have that insulin. You know, where's the justice in that? It's going to Aye. make me unwell. That It's the same with drugs. It, you know, people need substances in them, Sean. I know. And if we take away the substances, you better have the tools to, to deal with a trauma. I know. Otherwise, you're going to have really, really unwell wee people that are going to react and respond in the most horrendous ways to you. Which is happening. I mean, it's the prison system is very violent, you know. Um, and it's because of the the change in drugs. It's changed to spice and it's changed to like a tizzalam and stuff, which for them that doesn't really know is like a benzodiazepine that will drop your inhibitions a lot and bring out aggressive behaviour and stuff like that. And it doesn't show up in drug tests. So you can be out your nut and be on a Moore's policy or whatever it's called and then go and get a drug test. But a guy that's taking subway every day to hide his trauma or hide whatever, or taking trammies, whatever, taking a cup of cocoa, whatever, 
to hide that or just mask that trauma, but he can fail a drug test. So it's like all over the place for me, and it makes sense. I'm like, I, it's like you're jumping about, and I'm going, I'm, I'm saying, hey, I'm trying to make sense of your system here. Like I'm watching what you're doing, and I'm going, I, I don't know what, what you do, what is it you're trying to achieve here? Like I don't see where the outcome is, Natalie. And then you, I was, you hear these people with the mat standards, and you hear them with the trauma informed and this and that. I don't. I I would love to see, and you know, see people like Max Stoney. He's not coming out and talking for nothing. He's talking it because he's putting his neck on the line and going. And he, he, there needs to be a change here. We need change. And it's not see if you see see if they put their hands up and go. We need to try something else. It's not a defeat. No. It's actually it, it takes a bigger person to do it, and it's these people that talk to you behind your back. We know. We know it's broke. Well, no, but I can't, what, what can I do about it? You can do something about it. If, we all, if they all speak out, if, if all you join together and go, right, we need change, it's you guys. It, it's, it's, it's the people at Salton House that make the change. I don't know where you go, Natalie. I don't, it's such a hard, hard thing to navigate. But I've asked this question to James and that, so I'll ask it to you as well. Like, where would you, where would you change it? Where, what, what, what would you do with the system? How would you go about, can I, reforming it if you could reform it a wee bit a wee magic wand what would you do oh, it's like fucking talking heads into it I know. need to burn down the house you need, you need to in order for something to work you need to you need to completely rebuild it you know you can't uh, if a house is falling down you can't expect to just put in one new window and that house is going to be fully functioning like you can't the system is broken, Sean. It's completely broken. And like you say, you're one prisoner that tried to navigate through the system and you really, really struggled and your journey is different for somebody else's journey that's different for somebody else's. So if you've got 200 prisoners that all had a different journey, like that's bizarre, isn't it, right? Because everybody should have that same journey of repair, restore, get better, right. life skills, leave in jail like a whole person, no going back to poverty and disadvantage, going back to your community with a CV and being a better person. Like, you know, it's, we need to, in order to rebuild something, we need to completely crash it right down. And I think that's what Mick Stoney's trying to do with the new HMP Glasgow. I think that he's trying to be that role model prison establishment right. that can really say, this is how we're going to get it right. Because I've sat in so many meetings where, where, and I know I keep using him as an example, and it's just because he's an outstanding yeah, governor. That's a good example. But... Um, but I've sat and listened to him in meetings and, he, and he'll challenge people in headquarters, he'll challenge officers, he challenges me all the time, actually. But he wants to create a prison that's trauma-informed. Hey. Because, you know, he'll go to Gabon, Gabon Matty conferences, he'll really tune in to Fritzy Hortzman. He, like me, it's like, if you're a maths guru, like you need to look at that maths equation to solve it, don't you? And mathematicians will sit for weeks and years and they'll look at maths equations to try and solve this mm -hmm. equation. That's the same with a problematic person. You just need to sit with them. And so ultimately for me, right, I didn't have the tools to get better. So I just needed somebody to be like my sat nav to be like, right, you need to do this and go here and do that. Like, that's what we need to be doing. And we need one jail, Aye. no fucking 15 jails in Scotland. We need just one jail in order to get this right. We've only got 7,000 cons in Scotland, Sean. Aye. And look at that number of 7,000. Like how many of the men really need to be in prison and women, like really, really need to be in prison. Well, I've brought this up a couple of times as well. During Corona, they were able to—I don't know, half was it half half the prison population? Was it more than that? Like they, I remember, they had to, they, they, they got they got a lot of people out. So to me, that's you saying they're not really a problem with society. Are they a problem with society? Or is just again society just doesn't know what to do with them? It's the, like the last day that I'm working with the society didn't know what to do with her. She had been sectioned so many times that they then sent her case up to a judge to say like, what are we going to do with her? Aye. We've sectioned her. We can't keep her in the community, and ultimately they put her in the Cottonville. No. That lassie should never have been in Cottonville because what she learned in Cottonville was how to be a better drug addict, how to commit crime better, um, 
how to be a really shit mum. Like she didn't learn in restorative or, or how to repair. She learned everything how to be a, a worse person. Aye. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Like society just doesn't know where to place people like us sometimes. So the best place to put us is in a prison. And I think you get the odd person that will come out and go like, do you know what? Jail's, jail's easy and jail's... Do you know what? That That's their truth, right? And that's how bad it is at their home. At that place is... Because for me, jail was hell. I, I admit I hated every single minute of my prison sentence. I hated it. Um, it nearly broke me a few times. So I hate when I hear people saying it, but that just shows how bad it is at home that they want to come in. And I understand I've got I've got like I've got a cousin who functions better in prison mm -hmm. because he's 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 no grey outside, do you know what I mean? Um but that's because there's routine and stuff like that. It's not because it's a good place or it's a good environment. He's used to that environment outside. He's used to the same people yeah. outside. So going in there, you're just getting it. You're just getting told what to do. That's why you're doing better. It's not because the system's great and you're changing. It's because you're taking a guy out of mental chaos and going do that. And it's, you know, oh, I've got a wee bit of routine now, right? All right, I'll go to the sheds, come back, do that. Blah, 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 blah. So they get a wee bit of routine in their life and they come off things. And, oh, this is, but as soon as you fling them back out, they're going back to the same and put. They're all, all these people are for the same areas, Natalie. They're like, you know, you're selling the North End, East End. There's there's no many prisoners for the West End of Glasgow, is there? There's no, there's no many prisoners for different areas in Glasgow. Um, and this is, this is a recurring theme, by the way. I've kind of brought it up a few times. It's like, but there is no, if you go around the prison system, it's full of boys for the schemes, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, broken, broken boys, that's, you're not meeting many boys for Bears Den and Mogai in Berlin. They're, they're certainly not coming over to the recovery cafe. And if they are, it's alcohol related stuff, you know, where they're just being dom domestics and angry and aggressive full of alcohol. But it's predominantly areas that poverty and disadvantage are rife. So, and that's what we're working with. And it's we boys that's mum and dads have been addicts and alcoholics and criminals, and that's how they've been brought up and they've been dragged through the ringer, do you know what I mean? And not having any tools and people like us in society need to be the ones to, and I always joke about this, right? And say, I'll get your tools out and all that. And I'm, I'm not talking about like a blade or a set of two mills. I'm talking about, your morals and your integrity and like we're di different tools we're talking Aye. about now, do you know what I mean? And it's like these, and here's, a, this is a, a massive problem I've got that like in the jails back in the day, there used to be honour amongst thieves. Aye. And there used to be like a real sense of camaraderie in the jail, wasn't there? Like, no, I remember when I first went in, it was, it was just kind of dying out, but I know you're talking about Natalie. There was a real honour amongst thieves, like you had your own's back. Um, certain prisoners were not allowed to mix with general population. Aye. And it was like, if you'd done this kind of crime, you weren't, there, you know, there Aye. was certain things were allowed and certain things weren't. There. And the OGs, right? And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that I'm promoting. Um, criminals or people that go and, go and commit commit crime, but your OGs would be schooling the young team. Aye. So that's what used to happen in communities. You used to have people that would really school the young team and give them sets of morals and values. Like, yeah, they would be committing crime, but you know, you don't do this and you don't steal half your granny and Aye. you do this and this is the morally good. So you had your OGs really schooling the young team and that worked really, really good. But then we took all the OGs out of the game. Aye. So now what you have is the young team school and the young team, they don't have morals or integrity no. or values. They come from absolute deprivation. So if you've got some way, somebody with chaos, school and somebody with chaos, the outcome of that is going to be absolute chaos. Aye. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's, we don't have any of the, even when I look at National Top End, and now I'm like, we don't have a Sean Toll. Right. Or, or, a, or a big chief or a Mick Mahern. We don't have somebody that's prepared to put their neck out in the line right. for the younger generations. Like, I remember being in the recovery cafe and you guys, like, I remember saying to you, like, you know, we can't have drugs in here and we can't have this and right. that. And you're like, I'm not going to be a grass, Natalie. And I'm saying, you're not being a grass, Sean. Like, you go and speak to the cons and, and tell them you right. can't do that. It's not about coming to me and saying, he's up to this, he's up to that. That's not, I'm not interested. The bottom line is, I'm just coming in here to try and make a change. And you all proper stuck your neck out for me. And you've had my back. It was a beautiful thing, actually, right. because 
Um, every time I left that jail, I'd be like, the boys have really got my back. They really, but it was because you were living in that world. Do you know what I mean? I was leaving your world right. every day that I was leaving the jail, but you set something for all the future cons. Do you know what I mean? You've created right. a platform for all the cons that hopefully for the rest of my time will come in and be able to experience. But what you've created was we can give somebody a safe space to come in and say, I am absolutely fucked. And here's why I'm fucked. And we've got boys that will come in and say, like, I've been abused my whole right. life. And imagine being in a jail with 15 men in a room and being like, you know, you're not supposed to talk about it in a jail. It happened in like 2010 or that when it happened. Because everybody wears a mask. It's like, I'm going to take his head off and I'm going Aye. to chub him and it's who's who and who's who and who's punting and who's like, whose side are you on? Let's not fucking talk about Aye. size unless we're talking about Rangers and Celtic. Who cares? Aye. Who cares about the size? You know, we're all mm. like people that's just trying to get through a day. But like, I take my hat off to you because you's created something for the cons. Like everybody will go like, ah, brilliant, what you created with Cisco. And it wasn't me that created it, Sean. It was for prisoners created by prisoners it's just that i've kept that honor for you guys and i keep doing it because in another 10 years i would like to say right that's 22 lifers that i've supported through national will. top end I've, oh i definitely sure and i will because i believe i believe that everybody can repair and restore and i and i genuinely genuinely believe that the majority of society are not bad people like, right. we're not intuitively bad people. I have got mad fucking cycles out there that need to be dubbed up. But in any given day, I can go for Mother Teresa to Myra Hanley. That right. doesn't mean that I should be in the jail, you know? Like, me and Alec Cochran will have talks all the time. Like, people will annoy me. And in my head, I'm like, I fucking want to stab them in the neck. And I want to fucking reverse it over them. And <laughs> thank God I don't go to jail for what my head's saying. But everybody must think like right. that, right? But the young boys that grow up in the schemes... The impulsiveness, watching their dads doing it, watching their mas doing it. They just do. They just do it. They do. It, so it's like it comes into their head, and it's like I've got, I know boys in my life that I've like obviously had to kind of leave. I don't take it into day with that life anymore. But I know boys that like it, and some of them are the best boys that I know. Mm -hmm. But they've got that impulsive nature where you can't. You you need to. You need to give them a wee bit of respect to, and you need to, to, if you're ever wanting to nurture these people, because this is what we were talking about, and I, and I, I think it was James, James Docker, and I said to James, how do you break down the big egos? Because that is the task, that's the task where you walk into the hall, right, he's running the hall, he's a man, blah, blah, he's got a big name about him, I want to be like him. How, how do we stop that, Natalie? Because that's the way things are. When you go into that hole, you look at that guy and you go, oh, I want to be like him. How do you break down the big guns? That's where my, I've tried to think about it and I go, ah, where, do you, where do you go? Because that's what happens in the holes with the young team. We're not going to be able to do it in the prison, unfortunately. I don't believe we can do it from the prison, nor with the young team anyway. The only way we can capture these kids is at a school age. And we need to to really, really nurture them and work with them and provide avenues for them to deal with the, the existing... You know, if, it, if you've got a wee... You know, I was a kid and I'm saying I'm, I'm a kid at primary school right. and, and I've got 10 aces, Sean. You know, I'm, my thinking's off the deck task scale. My mental health's atrocious. I, I, when I look at numbers, I see that they eventually they'll turn into a letter. Aye. So no one sat and explained to me, actually, you've got dyslexia and there's lots of complex mental health, there's lots of learning issues with you. So because I would just sit and I'd be staring at a window or what I used to do in school, actually, and as I learned dead, dead quickly, as see if I took the top off of a pencil, took the rubber off a pencil, and if I would ram it right up my nose, I would take the skin off my nose and my nose would burst and it would just bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. That was it. That was all day you were sent home for school because you'd have to go up to Stop Hill Hospital, get your nose cauterised. Like, I was so traumatised that Aye. I was more worried about what was happening at home Aye. than I wanted to be at school. So I would do everything that I possibly could to be back in the house, to Aye. be like, what's happening in the house? And is Jamie getting lifted or is my man? Like, do you know what I mean? Like I was so, so confused. So I couldn't learn in school. And I know now there's wee kids staring out that window with the same issues. Like 
who's going to pick me up for school today? Is it going to be social workers? Is it going to be my mum and dad? Like, who's going to come and get me? Is my dad so, going to come down mad with it? Is my dad going to be burling? Is my mum going to have a black eye? So we need to be in the schools, right? Because see if we're in the schools and we're really, really mentoring these just to say, listen, here's the life that I've had. And it wasn't brilliant. And I'm all right now, hi, but... I, you know, people look at me and go like, I, you're, but you're brand new now, Natalie. And I'm like, do you live inside my head? No. Do you see like what my thinking is first thing in the morning? My head's a fucking circus, man. Aye. Like, you know, I had, I've had to learn tools that can quiet my mind down. Recently when we were in Spain, like my friend had said something and I went, oh, there's elements in my life that nobody will ever know. And my sister phoned me when we all went back home and she went back to California. She phoned me and she says, I want to speak to you about something you says, like, I'm your person. Like, right. I'm meant to know everything about you. And I says, listen, Kelly, I was in a relationship for nearly three years with somebody in the Mexican mafia, and there's an unspoken rule. Right. And that goes for anybody. Like, we, we talk about the sides over here, and, right. like, there's three years of my life, Sean, that nobody will ever know about. Like, right. there's things that I've I seen and witnessed, and the minute that comes out my mouth, Right. then I'm responsible for something to come back at me. There'll be a consequence for oh, that, right? Course, so, But my sister doesn't get that, my sister. But I'm your sister, just tell me. And I'm like, Kelly, if these things that happened in my life keep me up at night and give me nightmares and cause PTSD in me, if I share that with you, what's it going to do for you? It's going to harm you. Aye. So the best thing that I can do is just keep it to myself and work through it with a therapist. No, there's, definitely, there's definitely some things. I mean, Gabber, Matt, you know, I'll even tell you, like, you need to work within... Like when you try try and go external, I it's great to have somebody to talk to and like that. But the, some things you need to just externalize and keep. Um, and it, it's hard. There's there's things going on in the prison, and there's obviously things that go on that that you're no privy to and we that are going to just be there. They're always going to be there. There's always going to be sides. There's always going to be people that. I want to want everything. Do you know what I mean? And that's most of the people that I've met that are like that. I've had bad upbringings, that, like or they've had hard upbringings, and they've went. They've just no took the drug route. They've just went fuck this. I'm going to make myself something, and the only way I can make myself, I'm good at fighting. I'm good at violence, and I'm going to make myself money through that because I've got I've got nothing. It's either that or I've got that road there doing the addiction road so i get why they i get why these people exist do you know what i mean and i get why they would go like i don't give a fuck about your podcast whatever do you know what i mean like I, i'm i do what i do and that's it like that's fine that's their opinion but trying to keep the young team unimpressed with that is very hard it's very hard because they're coming for the same natalie they're coming for the same backgrounds and going look at him he's the only way i can make it that guy there, man, that guy's fucking got everything. He's got the big car, he's got the nice girlfriend, he's got the hoot. No, unbeknown to them, that the, the guy's traumatised. They, they are really traumatised as well. They might look the part and they might look this and that, but they're damaged. Do you know what I mean? And it's hard to get anybody when it's so young, 21, 22, and they're just starting that mental life to go, that's not what you want to be. You want to be like that. They go, no. <laughs> like, I, the, 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 I want the money and I want the fast cars and I want this. So you're right. You need to try and get it, go back, go into the schools, try and hang it. But they don't let people with convictions into schools. They don't let. They're just scared, Sean. They're just dead, dead scared. You know, I, I go and I speak at trauma conferences to to teachers and, and people in the government. And I always try and start it the same way. I always, and I do it for um, for this same woman all the time. And um, it's all professional people that Aye. come to our conferences. But I always start it the same way. So I always tell her to turn the lights off. So And they, they always, the, the introduction for Natalie, the speaker is, can you see me now? So I always ask her, the minute I go on the stage, turn all the lights off. And the first thing I'll say is, can you see me? Hey. Can you hear me? You didn't see me and you didn't hear me. Because that we don't see and hear these wee children. And when we do, we see and hear them as problems. Aye. Do you know what I mean? Whereas we're not saying, 
Natalie's mum's just got five years. Her dad committed suicide. She's staying with her grandparents. She's separated from her sister. Uh, the you know we're no we're not seeing all that. We're just seeing a wee problematic person. We don't have the resources in Scotland to pour into the schools for more pastoral care. People to be helping all these wee kids. Do you know what I mean? So. I, I, would in go in, like, I would go in a minute. I'd go in a heartbeat to go and tell young people. I offered my son school. I mean? So something happened to my youngest son and I really challenged them and says, you know, well, can I come in and speak to your teachers? And he was, oh, excuse me, pardon me. And I says, can I come in and speak to your teachers? Because my son wouldn't have reacted in the way that he did if your teacher... So the teacher, the way he spoke to my son, and Kobe's quite a sensitive wee kid. Um, but the way the teacher approached him was very angry and aggressive and spoke down to him and says, you'll be doing detention at the end of the day. And Kobe's very malignant, like me, and very off the chin when he walked away and went, so I will. But the teacher's caught it and says, what did you say? And started shouting at him. So the wee man ran into the toilet and messaged me saying, mum, my teacher's shouting at me and I'm so scared. Aye. So I phoned the school right away and says, you better get the head teacher on the phone to me right now. My son's meant to be in a safe place and he's messaging me saying that I'm scared. Aye. So when the teacher phoned me back to explain the situation, I'm saying, but that's not good enough. Your teacher should never yell at my son. Right. I don't shout at my Wayne Sean. And if I no. do, it's like, it takes a lot for me to shout in my house. Do you know what I mean? But shouting traumatises children. Especially if you read all, like, you're, you're any good trauma expert and all the ones that we've all mentioned all say that. Like, there's, you're, you're, you're putting a condition there. When you when you start like shouting at your children and stuff, you're putting a condition there that the only way we've got this contract is if you're good. You can't express yourself mm -hmm. any other way, or I, or I'll, you will be punished mm -hmm. for it. Um, and these people that these children that we're talking about are, it's it, they're not a problem until the criminal behaviour starts manifesting, and then it, it manifests in a the bigger problems and stuff, then then they become the front page of the daily record or the front page of the sun or whatever because of the crime they're committing and this and that. And you're like, these guys are so, they're, they're so, tr I don't know where you's comfy, but do you's, no, do you's watch what happens in these schemes? Like, do you see the, the people, the way they're brought up, the things they see, the things that they get involved in? It's like, it's you can say any kind of big, I've said this before, like a big gangster, and go, where, how did you get to where you are right now? And he goes, I don't know. I, don't, I genuinely don't know. It just, like, happened. Like, just met people in jail, met whatever. Like, met, just happened. And you're like, so that that's how you learned that face somebody maybe that was a bit older that took you under their wing and showed you the ropes on how, hey, don't do that, don't use drugs, don't take that. So you were influenced by a good, not a good, but somebody that was going to take them, but if you've got that bad influence, then you're, you're never going to, get, do you know what I mean? You're never, you're, you're only going to learn the bad behaviours, Natalie. And your good influences are few and far between. That's the dead, dead sad thing, Sean. Do you know what I mean? Like, Aye. who are all these kids' good influences in the world? I had a guy, Callum Scott, reach out to me recently. To, so he's trying to do a book on the most influential people in Scotland. And he says, Natalie, for years I was looking back in resources to say there's no book, there's no book right. exists and there's so many influential people in Scotland. So he's created a book to say, right, here is 200 of the most influential people in Scotland. And he was like, can I add you into the book? And I'm like, um, aye, but like, what have I done to be influential? Like, I'm just go. a pure gobby bitch that is no scared to speak her truth. But... Um, Obviously, I'm someone that is gobby, and that's the thing, Sean, I think, in order to be up against this, we're up against this narrative of uh, the good guy and the bad guy, and we need to send people to prison because if you commit a crime, then that's where you need to go. And we're not going to keep you in the community with the reality as you've got people that me, like me standing on platforms saying that prisons don't work for everybody, and actually right. the taxpayers are wasting billions and billions of money because out of the 7,000 and something prison population, you look at the people that should absolutely, absolutely, absolutely be there, right? So it's maybe, what, 3,000 prisoners? Right. So you look at that other 4,000, like there's other places we should be putting them. No. And if we started for the schools 
and really, really nurturing. Like trauma informed is a fucking, and I'm sick of saying this. It's an action. It's not a word. Like so, to be a trauma informed school, it's like let Natalie come in and kick off. Aye. Let Natalie come in and stare at the window. But what today is at lunchtime? Put something in place for Natalie so that you can be like, right, you don't understand maths. This is what we're going to do to support you. Do you know what I mean? Like Aye. we need to get, there's so many doctor surgeries that will say we're a trauma-informed surgery, but then you'll go in and there's a massive poster saying that if you disrespect the receptionist or you raise your voice, we're going to ask you to leave. That's not trauma-informed. Do you think it's just a buzzword that, what, what I've seen, I mean, I'm no a expert, I've read books on trauma and I think I'm quite well informed on trauma, but I'm certainly not an expert. But I see people flinging the word about and I, I don't think they could spell it. Everything's a buzzword. SPS, transforming lives. That's a buzzword. Trauma informed. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds great. Trauma informed, Matt standards, blah, blah, blah. And then I was at a roadshow not that long ago, and I'm, you know, I can sometimes be like you and that. Like, I can get quite, I, I can ask them, I can ask some hard questions, but they just actually, it was quite funny. They just actually just, just patched me. Just never even answered my question. It was a guy who danced, asked a question for the prison saying, look, can you say how we've got human rights in prison? Um, and this guy stood up for the SDF and went, oh, I mean, well, the, only, the only thing you don't have is uh, the right to freedom. You've got all the rest of your um, human rights. So I said, listen, see what you just said there. That really angered me. I says, I'm not angry at you. I says, but I've spent 15 years in prison. I say, so it was really angry you've said because i've never seen i've never been given human rights while i was in prison i said people could have cared less about but when i was there so it's quite um patronizing and, and and you annoyed me i don't mean to be like that but can you explain to me where the human rights are and the last went listen we're here to be positive today we're not answering next question i was like well, well. i would ask them when's the last time you said i served a sentence big man no no I know. <laughs> you know, because that's what we've got. In fairness, I did actually say, I've never been in prison. I did say that, but still, it was like, um, you're right, no. Uh, but we have white collar people. This is the thing about society is we have all these white collar people telling us this is how we're going to fix something, but they've never been part of the problem. So how can you fix something if you've never been part of a problem? It's like sitting in fucking Germany and deciding who fixes the roads in Scotland. It's not going to work out unless you've actually been on the road, Sean. It's um. absolute insanity. And I hear it all the time when you're in all these big meetings and you sit and I listen to professionals talking and I'm just like... Go and shut the fuck up. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're talking about trauma and you've probably never even fucking had a day's trauma in your life. Stop talking. Aye. Like it's, you're not going to fix someone with your closed mindset. And like the SDF's a perfect example. They're one of the biggest government funded organisations in Scotland. So they're going to sink to the party line, Sean. That's the bottom yeah. line. And that's why... Like at part of Cisco, I will never sell Cisco's soul to the devil. Right. I won't. I won't um, chase funding and be conditioned by a set of funding so that I can't sit on this platform and be vocal right. and say what I want to say. Like absolutely, I'll never sell my soul to the devil. Like I'm here for the cons, but I, I swim with it. I don't swim against the tide. You know, I don't swim against the system. I know that I need to. Um, I need to align myself with the system, oh, that, which means that I need to go with their policies, I need to go with their legislations. It doesn't mean that mm -hmm. I agree with them, right? I don't agree with half of them, but I can't swim against their tide. But what I can do is hopefully help them rebuild Aye. a better fucking wave. Like, that's the way I see it. I'm better being I inside yeah. the party and I inside the tent Aye. than pissing for the outside. No, yeah, you're doing it, Natalie, but that's the thing, and obviously what you're working with, with Mick and stuff like that in Berlin, um, and I think that you're, you're, what you're doing is an amazing job. So, like, obviously we're kind of, kind of coming up to near the end of the podcast, right? So kind of going to a mere positive. So can you tell us some stuff with what you're doing at Cisco? What is, what's happening at Cisco? Like, what's, what you're doing at Cisco the new, Natalie? So the Cisco's, we've just moved to Springburn. So we've just moved to the Clydesdale Bank in Springburn. So I'm from Springburn and um, that's where my dad was from. And my dad obviously has passed as he was a bank robber. He committed crime. So we've moved into the Clydesdale Bank. Uh, he did rob the bank. So I get to make an amendment in his name. 
um, because now outside the bank will be a massive name saying Cisco. So I get to hopefully make an amendment back to the people that he harmed, right? Because it's not, and I can laugh about it with my family because they'll go, you've got some brass neck. I can't believe okay. you're going to the place where your dad robbed. And I'm like, but it's not about that. I'm not doing it for ego or a... Uh, this is about me making an amendment back. It, that's restorative, Aye. you know, and it's it's um, it's ironic, but it is restorative. And we're front and centre, Sean. We are right front and centre in the heart of deprivation, which means we're getting the footfall of people that are really, really needing help. Aye. I mean, there's not been an alcohol and drug service in Springburn for, I don't even know if there ever has been one Aye. that was really, really meaningful. I am creating homeboy industries in Scotland. Like, Aye. I've asked so many people going to join me. Uh, James Dockery, Alec Cochran, Eddie Gorman, like Aye. all your gurus and your warriors going to join me because I can't date myself, but everybody's busy on their own mission, which is totally cool. Aye. But I'll do it myself. Um, and then Sean. we can do, Natalie, we're there for you. Yep. We're, like, we're, I would love to be part of that. I'd love to help you. Um, I mean, something like that would be amazing here. And I think you would be a great champion for it. And I think obviously getting the names you're talking about um, would definitely make a difference. So just to kind of finish up, what would uh, what's next for Natalie? Which so obviously you've got like your thoughts on the homeboy. Hope that's going to be kind of a long long term thing. What's next? What's so what's on the the pipeline for you now? What's just kind of similar about the new, just working away. Busy, busy, just um, in Berlin, in Low Moss. I would like to hope that at one point the Scottish government would come and say, like you know, why have you got this model that's working extremely well? Where you're offering a restorative approach to justice, you're keeping lifers out the jail, because we do the full journey with you, Sean. Aye. We don't just like support you in prison and then that's it, you're ditched. It's like, we'll support you in prison, we'll do the gate lip with you, we'll hold your hand the whole way and then we'll offer you a wee community platform. But it's like, I don't know, I just know that the day that I, I won't ever give up on people. Like it's so important for me to, to never give up on people because too many people gave up on my dad. Too many. I've lost six family members to drug-related deaths. You know, I've got an uncle that took a parcel back into the jail um, for whatever reason. I don't know what his reason for doing it, Sean. And people have tried to tell me, but I'm like, I'm better <sighs> known on well, the well, reason well. because then I can sleep at night. Aye. But he took a parcel into the jail and that parcel burst. Now, he told the prison officers, you better get me to the hospital. I've got a parcel inside me and it's burst. It took them, what, 10 hours to get him to a hospital. By the time they got him there, he died. So, you know, I've, I know that, one, I can't swim against the tide. Two, that I have to go with a system and try and help them rebuild a system that's going to be better for men like you. Like, I watched you. I watched, like, I watched you be broken in the jail, Sean. And it's, it's very hard. Probably people won't see it because you're out now and um, you're doing this, which is a fantastic thing to do, but... How do we give you back all the years that society took off you for a crime that you did never commit, right? And mm. we can say, oh, you can't talk about this because I can talk about it. Like, you might not be able to right. talk about it, but the reality is everybody knew you didn't commit that crime, Sean. Everybody right. knew it. The PF knew it. The courts knew it. The systems knew it. But who stuck up for you? So what I got to see in that jail was somebody that one should have never been there and how much the system really, really beat you down and broke you. Aye. But you are a true testament to yourself, actually, because you demonstrated resilience by putting yourself through a law degree, trying to keep your head above the parapet, you know. And that, that's like pure mad bravery, you know, really. But there's a there's lots of people like you in there, Sean. We just need to find them and nurture them and love them. And then you guys are the ones that are going to restore Scotland. We people like me being your sat-nav because somebody was my sat-nav and it got me to where I'm at and I just figure, see if I just need to be somebody's map to Aye. get them to where they need to be, then that's all that I need to be. Brilliant. And honestly, Natalie, I, can't, I just, I, I'll say it again, just to say like the, the recovery cafe that, that you built in Malini is by far the best model I've seen um, for people changing and for the better. Yeah, I've not I've not seen a system that's even close to it. So hopefully we can get you back on here at some point when you do get homeboy up mm -hmm. and, and, and get everything and would love to have you back on Natalie uh, at some point. So thank you very much for coming on and it's been brilliant having you on. Thanks,